Okay, so uh, I'm going to uh, risk making this a little boring, I don't know. Uh, but I'm going to do the same problem two more times using the new convention. We're going to see how it fixes it. That's do what I'm going to do. Do what you're planning to do. What? Do what you're planning to do. <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> I can't do that either. OK. As long as it's on a rope, I can do all that stuff. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to do the same as before, but with the new sign convention. So we have 500 down. 500 down, 1,000 up, and we want to calculate the internal loads there. So that's 0.25, and that's 0.75. So I'm going to do it first from the left. We have 500 down, and all we have left are those internal loads. That's a fixed joint, and that fact hasn't changed. Um, but now we're going to use that new sign convention. So notice that that T, V, and M, it's just a new way of expressing the, um, of expressing the force vector and the couple that come from a fixed joint. So we have T going this way, because we're looking at the right side of the sliver. OK, so we have P going that way. We have V going down. And we have M going counterclockwise. Um, so Newton's second law says 0, negative 500 plus T0 is going in the positive x direction plus what's this what's the vector representation of the shear force zero, yep zero negative v is equal to zeros and so this gives us that there's no internal tension there's an internal shear force of negative 500 And then the rotational equation says um, so our about point is at the left. So there's no moment produced by the 500. There's the couple. And then what's the moment produced by V? The moment arm here is 0.25. You could set up a table again. This is a rigid body problem. But, uh, yep, so uh, this V would produce a clockwise rotation around A. So we're going to have negative Vx is equal to 0. Plug negative 500 in for V, and we get that M is equal to negative 125 newton meters. Any questions about that? All right, so now I'm going to do it from the right. Uh, v, yeah, um, the moment arm is 0.25 times V. 
Yeah, thanks. That's okay. So, 0.25. That's the moment arm. Okay, so now we'll do the same thing from the right side. I'll put the about point here. Um, we have a downward force of 500, an upward force of 1,000. And now, since we're looking at the left side of that sliver of material, a positive tension would be this way. A positive shear force would be this way, and a positive bending moment would be that way. So Newton's second law says um, 0, negative 500 plus 0, positive 1,000. Um, plus negative t0, because t is in the negative x direction. v is in the positive y now, so this is 0v is equal to zeros. So we still get t is equal to 0. And now we get v is equal to negative 500. I hope that's what we got before. Yes. And the rotational equation says, so there's no moment produced about A by the 500 Newton force. There is a clockwise moment produced by the 1,000. And that has a moment arm of 0.5. So negative 0.5 times 1,000. Um, and then there is a clockwise moment produced by this couple m. So minus m. A clockwise moment produced by v. So minus 0.75 v is equal to 0. So we have negative 500 minus m minus, uh, so minus a negative, so plus 375 is equal to 0. So m is equal to negative 125 newton meters. So now those values match. And the bottom line is um, treating these internal loads problems as loads on a sliver of material with its own sign convention fixes the problem <coughs> of um, what ambiguous answers ambiguous signs on answers okay so um, 
we're going to always work from the left. Um, and so our signs are, you know, our sign convention is always going to be T going to the right, V going down, M going counterclockwise. So in a sense, if you question why I went through all this, uh, that would be, you know, that's something I ponder sometimes too. But, um, <laughs> but the point of all of this was like, well, why did we mess with the sign conventions at all? After using vector sign conventions forever, all of a sudden we're coming up with this nonsensical, you know, V pointing down. Um, we, we didn't have to choose the sign convention we did, but we had to choose something based on that sliver versus something based on forces and couples on a surface. So that's why we did that. Um, so now think about the same problem, kind of. But this time we don't know exactly where the internal load is. We don't exactly know where the cut is made. It's at some value or some location x from the left end um, where x is between 0 and 0.5. Okay, the, uh, this notation means x is in the interval uh, from 0 to 0.5. And let's calculate the internal loads. So we know, just sort of generally speaking, the free body diagram looks like this. We know that there's a 500 Newton force there. Okay. We know that there's no 1,000 Newton force because we're only looking at x values between 0 and 0 0.5. Okay. Right, but we're not ever going to have square brackets. So yes, that's right. Um, yeah, so another way to say this is x is... Uh, greater than 0 and less than 0 0.5, but we're not including 0 or 0 0.5. So we know that, that the 500's there. We know the 1,000 isn't there. And we know that we're calculating T, V, and M. Okay? And we know that this distance is X. Okay? So Newton's second law says um, 0, negative 500 plus T0 plus 0, negative V is equal to zeros. So the tension is still zero. The shear force is um, negative 500. Uh, this is negative V. And then go to the rotational equation. Calculate the moments about A. There's no moment produced by the 500. There's a couple m. 
and there's a moment produced by v, but now we don't know the moment arm exactly, right? It could be any value of x. But whatever x is, we know that we can represent it as a clockwise moment produced by uh, with a magnitude of v times x. So I'm going to just write this as negative vx. Okay, that's equal to zero. Plug that in for v, and we get that m is equal to uh, m is equal to oh so negative times negative so that's positive so negative 500 x okay so um i introduced this as if we just didn't know what that x value was you know but notice that what this did was actually give us a function of what the internal loads are as x varies, okay? And if you plugged 0.25 in for x, you'd get the same values back for all of these that we had when we just cut it at 0.25. But the benefit is we don't, this doesn't only tell us the internal loads at 0.25, it tells us all the internal loads from x equals zero to x equals 0.5. Okay, so um, yeah, that's exactly right, because this general free body diagram isn't valid anymore once we get to 0.5, okay? Then you'd have to deal with that 1,000 being in there. And um, so this lets us represent... T, V, and M over an interval, not just at a value. Um, as functions of X. And, you know, I said that internal loads are the way they're sort of the first step into figuring out um, where a material is likely to break, how it's going to deform. So it makes sense that we wouldn't just want to calculate, in some cases, you might just want to calculate internal loads at a single point. But more often, you'd like to know how those internal loads vary as you go across the beam, because you want to, say, you want to be able to say, here's identify, this is the point where I'm worried about this beam breaking. You know. And so we're going to use this idea, calculating the internal loads as a function of x, to find you know, where, the, where the things are likely to break, where the deformation is going to be big, that kind of stuff. OK. Um, Okay, so um, what intervals are uh, allowable when um, when you're, uh, let's see, which intervals are allowable for um, representing by x? That sounds terrible. I don't know, go home and come up with a better wording for that. Okay, so like I chose, I chose x to represent the interval from 0 to 0.5. And I chose that. That's allowable. But how do we know what, what regions are allowable? And when we have to go on and calculate a new function. Um, 
and that gets to the point, the the point that you made, the question you asked. Um, it depends on where these special things happen. I'm going to call them important points. They're important points in this calculation. So, so it depends on the locations of, I'm just going to call them important points. And those important points are um, endpoints of the beam. The locations where point loads are applied and third locations where distributed loads change Once you've identified those, um, you'll let x vary across or along intervals between these important points. So those important points are the cutoffs of your intervals. Okay, so let's keep going with this same simple example. Um, so we're going to use the same example, but now we're going to represent the internal loads for every value along the whole length of the beam. So we'll find P, V, and M. as functions of x for the entire beam. Uh, the one that I just did before this was just for half of the beam until we got to that 1,000 Newton force. OK, so um, we have 500 down. 1,000 up, 500 down. Where are the important points for this beam? Yep, that's right. Here, here, and here, and there's no distributed loads. Um, so we're going to have to, we're going to have to um, make two cuts. We're going to have to do two representations of this thing. One with x values between 0 and 0.5, and one with x values between 0.5 and 1. Okay. So two cuts. x values between 0 and 0.5. and x values between 0.5 and 1. So cut 1. Uh, this is for x values between 0 and 0.5. This is the one we've already done. Um, Okay, so notice that when we did this, um, when we said that x could vary anywhere between 0 and 0.5, that didn't determine where we started on the left. 
for the thing that we're isolating. It only determined where we're ending on the right. So we're always starting all the way from the left. Okay, the x value only only tells us where the right is ending. Okay. Even though we're not including zero. Yeah. So x x is just telling us where the right side of our of our isolated piece is. But our isolated piece always goes from zero to that x value. No, uh, so um, think of it as, so when we were uh, working our way from the left, okay, and we wanted to calculate the, um, we wanted to calculate the internal loads when x is equal to 0.25, okay, the way we went about it is we isolate, isolated an entire chunk from the left side to a distance 0.25 away, okay? Like that was our strategy for calculating the internal loads at 0.25, okay. okay? And then when we went to, then we went from saying, okay, well, let's do a little more than that. Let's not just calculate the internal loads at 0.25. Let's calculate the internal loads at an arbitrary x value, okay? So we, so we changed, instead of, calling that location 0.25, we call that location x. But we still, our strategy was to calculate the loads at this cut, at this location x, by isolating a piece that goes all the way from the left to that x value. Because... Um, the x value doesn't, so um, if you go back to which one? If you go back to this piece where we're, where did I have that? We're calculating the, the internal loads at 0.25, right? But we're still including all of these values that aren't 0.25 in our isolated piece. That's just because if we didn't do that, we'd have to have another unknown fixed joint on the other side, and we have extra variables that we couldn't solve for. So it's a strategy for us. Like, how are we gonna, how are we gonna figure out what these internal loads are at 0.25? We're gonna lump the surface that we want in with all the other material where we know all these loads. So if this, if it makes sense to calculate the internal loads at a distance 0.25 away by isolating this whole chunk, okay, then hopefully it makes sense when this is x to have the strategy of calculating the internal loads at x by lumping it in with all these other pieces on the left. I, that is to say, it does make sense. Hopefully, it makes sense to you. Yeah. I, that's all. This is always a confusing thing for people. But yeah, so I, I'm sort of glad to to talk about it now and at least start getting. You know, you can start to kind of wrap your head around it. But I mean, I think I really feel like the key to understanding it is understanding it with that first cut that was just at 0.25 before we bring any variables into it or anything. Um, I guess for me it would be confusing because let's say that was a 300 piece of equipment that you have 500 and then 1,000 and you're going from the 500 to the 1,000. Do you include that 500 or do you include that 1,000? Yeah, we're always going to include everything all the way from the left to wherever our cut is. 
No, it, it actually won't. I suppose you could do it that way, but it, it's going to go all the way from the left end too. The only thing that X is representing is that right end. But the reason that we're always going all the way from one end to the place where we're making the cut is because we know all the forces. You know, It's the same reason that if you're, um, well, Right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Exactly. I mean, it's it's really in a way it's the same principle as like um, if you're trying to say you have a box on the floor and you're trying to calculate the forces that the box applies to the floor, right? You isolate the whole box. Well, why? You don't care about that. All you care about is this little area here. Why not isolate some infinitesimal piece right at the floor? Well, because then you'd have... All that's doing is bringing more unknowns into it, you know? What you want to do is, is isolate a piece where you know all the forces on it except the thing that you're trying to calculate. So, and that same principle is why we're going to go, on all of our cuts, we're going to go all the way from the left to the cut that we want. But I, I mean, I know this is, uh, this is a little tricky and I think little by little it'll make more sense. And um, yes, the right side, the, re the right side of the piece can take any value from, so what we're doing represents everything from a tiny little chunk with the 500 Newton here, and you know it goes a millimeter to the right, all the way to something that where it goes from the 500, and this is 0.2499. We're always including the left, but the x value represents the right, the right side. Okay. Uh, any other questions right now? I guess we'll just have to finish this next time. Um. No, no, no. That's a. It's a good. I mean, it's just. Uh, that's gonna be an issue that I think everybody's gonna sort of struggle with in their own way, and um, hopefully, just as we keep doing these, it'll makes sense, you know. But uh, it's good to get that out out in the open right now.